Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Finance Zone. It doesn't sell anything you could pick up and put in your pocket. We never paid any money directly. Yet now, after its latest earnings report, Google's parent company, Alphabet, has a market capitalization larger than Apple's as shares rose sharply in after-hours trading. That makes it the most valuable company in the world, worth nearly $520 billion, or 362 billion pounds. So how did it get here? Google's success originated in one simple insight from its founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. They realized in the late 1990s that the sprawling, chaotic mass of material that was cascading onto the World Wide Web could be tamed by ranking search results according to their popularity, making millions from online advertising and embracing some of the most challenging new ideas in the world of technology. And most of us use it day in and day out. They haven't looked back. To check out the snowfall before you book a last-minute skiing holiday, to email the boss you won't be in, to translate your child's French home, and yet, with success have come doubts over whether Google's dominance of the market is fair to other players, whether their growing influence allows them, along with other multinational giants, to pay less tax than many feel is warranted, whether the information they hold about us grants them too much power. Today, we're going to be talking about the rise of Google. Make sure you stay, as you don't want to miss out on the valuable information. Also, remember to subscribe and click on the notification bell. In the beginning, perhaps there's no greater testament to Google's, G-O-O-G, success than the fact that it has become a verb. We Google for information in the same sense that we drink water. However, Google as a company has grown far beyond search. And this article will review the business model and strategies that have made Google, along with its parent company, Alphabet, one of the most successful companies in the world. Pulling together $1 million from family, friends, and other investors, Mr. Bryn and Mr. Page launched their company on 7 September 1998. Known in a previous incarnation as Backrub, the new company name was a play on a large number, Google, one followed by 100 zeros. The name Google originated from a misspelling of Google, in which refers to the number represented by a one following by 100 zeros. Page and Bryn write in their first paper on the page rank, we chose our system's name, Google, because it's a common spelling of Google, or 10100, and fits well with our goal of building very large-scale search engines. There are uses of the name going back at least as far as the creation of the comic strip character Barney Google in 1919. British children's author Enid Blyton used the phrase Google Bun in The Magic Faraway Tree, published in 1941, and The Folk of the Faraway Tree, published in 1946, and called the clown character Google in Circus Days Again, published in 1942. There's also the Googleplex Star Thinker from Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In March 1996, a business called Groove Track Productions applied for a United States trademark for Google for various products, including several categories of clothing, stuffed toys, board games, and candy. The firm abandoned its application in July 1997. Since then, the company has grown steadily to dominate online search worldwide, and with that taking a huge substantial share of online advertising revenues. Google tames the sea of information. Google's original business was creating algorithms to help people sort quickly the rapidly growing amount of content being put online. Rather than employ editors and researchers to curate links for specific queries, Google began building algorithms that scored the content it was indexing against specific criteria. These included novel concepts like inbound links from trusted sources, as well as standard measures like keyword frequency and page titles. All of these pieces came together in a page rank that decided where a site would display on a specific query. Using this scoring approach, Google was able to serve up more accurate results than many of the existing search engines that preceded it in the market. The algorithm was, and still is, being constantly tweaked and updated to give users the most relevant results. Because it started strong and just kept getting better and better, Google became the go-to search engine for the internet in the space of a few years. Monetizing Search AdWords The launch and subsequent iterations of the search algorithm set the method that Google has brought to every subsequent product. Although they had already proven successful at prototyping and improving, Google wasn't initially making a lot of money for having the best search page on the market. Three years into its existence, Google took the first step towards monetizing its position in search by introducing Google AdWords. Initially using the cost per thousand CPM model, where advertisers paid for impressions rather than clicks, AdWords underwhelmed at first. Again, Google started tweaking and updating the AdWords platform in the same way it iterated the search engine algorithms. Within three years, AdWords transformed into an automated pay-per-click ad auction that brought the concept of relevance to digital advertising. Google didn't simply focus on selling ads to advertisers on any keyword, 
and instead offered relevant ads that resulted in more clicks and more revenue for Google. To this day, AdWords generates automatic revenue that powers Google's activities. AdWords was followed by AdSense, which allowed anyone with a website to access the Google's advertising inventory, effectively setting up Google for dominance in digital advertising. Becoming a digital powerhouse A key component of Google's success is the company's ability to launch a prototype or beta version of a product and continue to make improvements with each iteration. Google's initial business model focused on building a powerful search engine based on algorithms that help people sort through vast amounts of content to deliver accurate results for each search query. With the ad piece in place to complement search, Google began to innovate in earnest. Some moves were obvious, such as Google publishing and acquiring digital assets that would deliver more ad-driven revenues as traffic grew and more ad space as content increased. These included YouTube, acquired 2006, Google Maps, 2005, Google Blogger, 2003, and Google Finance 2006. However, Google also created a number of sites and web apps that weren't initially built to be monetized through ads. Google Books falls into this latter category as it's a repository of books online with ads playing a very small role. Similarly, ads are hard to find on Google News, a real-time collection of current content from thousands of news sources. Gmail 2004 started out ad-free and cost-free, but newer iterations give the users the choice between free with ads or paid without ads. The first versions of all these sites were far from perfection. Google put up the beta versions and then allowed users to find and prioritize the improvements to be included in their next version. Innovation on the internet and beyond. Google continues to grow its ad revenue and improve the sites and services that generate even more ad revenue. For many of us, it's difficult to remember what searching was like before autocomplete and instant results. And it's a rare address that isn't easily pinpointed in Google Maps. Constantly improving flagship products is a basic business practice, of course. The more interesting factor in Google's ongoing success story is the dedication to continuous innovation. Google sees innovation as part of the mission of the company and empowers its employees to get creative. This is how an internet company started building wearable tech, mobile operating systems, driverless cars, and renewable energy. Money's no longer Google's primary concern, as it has enough to make the capital investment needed to create a beta version seem small in comparison. The company culture is focused on innovating first, getting the real user data second, and worrying about monetizing afterwards. With Google's ability to generate revenue through AdWords, the monetizing of a product is fairly straightforward as long as enough people want to use it. Do no evil. So has Google abused its dominant position? Its sheer size has given it access to politicians in capital cities around the world. Now, some are arguing that the company has captured government's thinking and is being given an easier ride on tax. Google, like many large companies, does not disclose how much tax it pays in each jurisdiction that it operates. But in a letter to the Financial Times last week, its communications director for Europe, Peter Barron, did say, As a U.S. company, we pay the bulk of our corporate taxes in the United States, $3.3 billion in the last reported year. Famously, Google originally had a slogan, Don't be evil, for which it has sometimes been mocked. That was always pretty silly, says Brian Weiser. It betrayed a sense of idealism. But he does think there are people within the company who genuinely believe in the motto and that it has stopped Google from abusing its dominant position. As bad as some observers think Google's behavior has been, it could have been far, far worse, he says. He says he can't see any of the consumers have been directly harmed by Google's dominance, though advertisers may be more justified in complaining. Conclusion Google has two core components. One is a search engine that is preferred by most people in the world. The second is self-serve ad network that generates revenue off of that search engine and the many digital assets Google owns. Google uses that revenue to pay for the rapid prototyping of new ideas, which often grow into the new sources of revenue. This simple model has allowed Google the freedom to undertake the projects it wants, even if the return on investment isn't immediately clear. That said, Google has had failures. For example, Google Video was washed away with the acquisition of YouTube, and Google Plus, the company's foray into social media, was slowly phased out. Whether it's a spectacular failure or a quiet retreat, the fact of failure hasn't changed Google's model of getting a prototype into beta and then integrating it based on user data. If a product is not bringing in enough users, it's packed up for another time and the lessons learned are applied to the next idea. And for Google, there always seems to be the next idea. Thanks for watching. While you're here, go ahead and click one of these two videos on your screen. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below. We'll see you there, and thanks for watching.